seems almost superhuman. Time after time, he cheats death. Fame brings him incredible wealth. His rock star status provides an endless parade of women. Oh, oh my God. But fame and fortune come at a high price. The love between a father and son strained by a lifetime of conflict. And his fall from glory comes hard and fast. Still, he remains the greatest daredevil in history. My name is Evil Knievel. I'm a professional daredevil. I underwent 14 major open reduction operations. I will never, ever, ever jump again I'm through. They would cut me open, put steel into me. Whoa, there's been a mistake. I was a dead man. I never thought that I had a prayer. The ship's going down. In every adversity, there's an equivalency to benefit if you just look for it. Here we go. The last of the gladiators, the all-time king of the daredevils, Evil Cleveland. Attacking a man with a bat was not heroic. A security Titan Tony 12 a shotgun. If I'd have died, they'd have said, well, the daredevil died. Evil Knievel, that was his grand finale. But excuse me, I didn't. I'm still alive. In the mid-60s, a young motorcycle rider from Butte, Montana roared onto the American scene on a sweet ride much like this one. His name was Robert Craig Knievel, but you know him as Evil Knievel. In a few short years, he became a unique one-man super phenomenon, a modern-day gladiator facing death just to take us on a thrill ride. The years of fame and fortune were a far cry from his early days. First thing I ever remember was I got on a little tricycle when I was a little kid and pedaled it over the Texas Avenue Bridge. And a man in a car stopped to put me in his car and put my tricycle in his trunk and took me back to my mammy. That's what I used to call my grandparents was mammy and pampy. When I was a little boy, I'd go through Reno on the way to Oakland or San Francisco where my dad lived, and I'd stop to see my mother. I never really got along with my mother. And I think I know why my dad didn't. She was a very overbearing person. And uh, I'd go on to California and be with my dad. But he had a family of his own, and it was tough. And I, I'd always go back to Butte to be with my grandparents. And spend the rest of the summer playing baseball football, whatever we were doing. And I was on the track team. I was a ski jumper. I played hockey. I really enjoyed myself growing up there. I don't think there was a better city in the world to grow up in than Butte, Montana. There was a robbery up in Great Falls, Montana, where this thief had stolen these gold rings and was in the paper. So I went over to the dime store and bought a whole bunch of rings, and I was peddling them all down at the high school. These kids all thought I was the one that stole them. I was kind of an outlaw. I was a good safe cracker. I did it up until I was about 22 or 23 years old. I don't know why, I was a good kid. I just got a thrill out of it. I just got hooked up with the wrong crowd. And most of them, all these places I robbed, they had insurance. I'd see the next day, they'd say I took three times the money I had. They were trying to screw the insurance company. So in the end run, you might say I created a lot of business for people. That's just the way you look at it. But the reason I quit, I had so much pressure, I'm mean, scared to death I'd go to the penitentiary. When you're in a bank, a federal bank, trying to put nitroglycerin in a door, knowing that if you get caught, you're gonna go to jail for 15 years, 20 years. It is the worst thing that you can go through. And I said to myself when I looked in the mirror, what in the hell is the matter with you? Can't you live like a, a real person in society and amount to something in life? I remember throwing the burglar tools and some dynamite into the Sacramento River and just 
telling myself I would never wrong another human being as long as I lived. I loved Linda. I just loved her. I met her at a youth center. She was a cheerleader, and her dad was well-known, John. Her dad forbid me to see her after I kidnapped her the first time. I took her away tied up in a car the first time from a theater with a boyfriend. A month or so later, I got her again on this ice skating rink next to her house, and I took her down and hid behind this church. So I talked her into going away and marrying me. So we're on our way to Coeur d'Alene, Idaho to get married. It snowed so bad, we had to turn around and come back. So we drive back towards Butte, and there's a big roadblock. Boy, they pulled me out of that car and handcuffed me and put me down in the snow, and they took me to the county jail and locked me up. Oh, her dad was mad. So he made a deal with me that night. He said, I won't press charges against you, but you don't see her until she gets out of college. So then, a few weeks later, her dad was fishing at the time up in a mountain lake. So I took her in my grandmother's car, and we went to Dillon, Montana, and we got married. By the time he got back home, we'd been married for two or three days. My dad bought me my first motorcycle, the PSA 125, and I was racing motorcycles for a hobby then. I still wasn't doing something where I had that challenge, where I had that lump in my throat and that knot in my stomach. I was looking for that all of my life, and then came the idea for the jump. And I don't know why, I did it, I jumped on a Honda, 250 Honda Scrambler, over these mountain lions and these snakes. But we got rattlesnakes in these boxes, cardboard boxes. Anyway, I jumped and I was short, and I knocked the back end out of this last box. All these rattlesnakes all got out of there. Everybody was afraid to grab them. They were scrambling all over the racetrack. People were getting up and running. And I was on my motorcycle. I, I got up there on top of the hill and I was looking, laughing at all these people. I think that was the first public jump that I made, really. My buddies, Marco Stanisic and Louis Markovic, they helped me drill every hole in my takeoff ramp and my landing ramp. They weighed six tons. I loaded my ramps on those trailers with a forklift, strapped three motorcycles up there, went to Indio, California. I was, didn't know what I was doing. Indio is the biggest retired person's home in the world. And I went up there with a daredevil show thinking I could draw the whole town. I didn't have very many spectators. They didn't want to see any motorcycle there at all. But all I wanted to do was make a living. I loved Linda and the kids. I loved them dearly. And I wanted to provide for them. It was my second show, and they ran a motorcycle or a car at me, and I'd jump in the air and spread my legs, go underneath me. This guy named Dale, ran this Norton 750 motorcycle at me right down the track at 50 or 60 miles an hour, and I jumped too late. And when I jumped, it hit me right in the balls. I mean, it just slaughtered me. Knocked me up, I did cartwheels and landed on the ground. They thought I was dead. And boy, I'll tell you, what, I never did that stunt again. Man, oh man, oh man. And I had found something in my life that gave me that lump and that knot in my throat and my stomach that was legal, that was legitimate, something that I could do honestly. And I had that challenge within me. It was the best thing I ever had. With the launch of Evil Knievel's Daredevil Thrill Show, Robert Craig Knievel finds an occupation that gives him the adrenaline rush he craves. After I jumped several times, with the show, the jump got so big and so many people came to see it that I didn't need the rest of the show anymore. If you owned a racetrack, I'd call you up and I'd say, hi, this is Evil Knievel. I'll come to your place and jump. What do you charge for a ticket? So you'd say, well, $3 a ticket. I'd say, well, you charge $4 a ticket and give me the extra dollar. If I didn't trust a promoter, I'd make him bring the gate receipts over my half and stick it right in my safe. You know, and I run into some real jerks. Well, it'll be all right in my office. I'd say, well, I'd just sit down and cross my arms. If they didn't like it, they could make the jump. It's fat ass. They couldn't do anything. But if he is to survive financially, he will need a big break to jumpstart his daredevil career. 
That break comes in March of 1967 with a brief appearance on ABC's Wide World of Sports. I was tied up with the best promotional man in the world, J.C. Agajanian. The first time I ever jumped for him was when I started with Wide World of Sports. I was at Ascot Speedway during a motorcycle race, and J.C. Agajanian had asked Wide World of Sports not only to come to the motorcycle race, but to film my jump. This is Evil Knievel, and uh, his specialty in sports is to take a motorcycle up over a ramp and leap through the air some 90 feet. That's what he's going to try to do today, over 15 automobiles. Now, have you ever done 15 before, Evil? Bill, I never have. I uh, missed a jump up in the northwestern part of the United States over 13, and I was uh, hospitalized and laid up for nearly five months, and I sure hope that doesn't happen today. I didn't use a speedometer. I didn't use a tachometer. I did it all by the feeling of the seat of my pants. Here's the thing, how can you take your eyes off of a runway you're going down at 70 or 80 miles an hour and look down at a tachometer or speedometer? If you do that, you might lose line and sight on the, on the line that's going up the middle of the ramp. I just thought that I was good enough so that I could keep my eye on that line and so that I'd take off in a straight line and hit that landing ramp. He'll build up speed as quickly as he can, and here he goes. A beautiful leap as Evil Knievel gets the raw approval from the crowd here, going beautifully over 15 cars. The runway was short on the front of the half mile, and I had to use a parachute to stop that motorcycle with before it hit the wall. I had a parachute on the back of my motorcycle, so when I jumped in tight places, I released it, and it stopped me, so it picked me right up, and picked the whole back end of the motorcycle up. I remember it was quite a thrill for me, and that's, that's when I started with wide world, I really didn't realize the power that I had at that time. I didn't really realize that I'd be number one. Of course, they didn't either. I'm on the way from Los Angeles to Las Vegas to watch Roger Rouse, who was a great friend of mine, fight Dick Tiger for the light heavyweight championship of the world at the convention center. I sat right at rings. I sat right with Sonny Liston. Anyway, I saw this guy come through the doors. Hustle and bustle, gray suit, real flamboyant guy. Had two or three bodyguards with him. I said, who the hell is that? Sonny says, that's Jay Sarno. He's the owner of Caesar's Palace. I thought if I could perform at a big place in Vegas, it would really help me that I could perform around the world. I could write my own ticket. Now, I'm broke. I must have had, believe me, $100 on me. So I call up Caesars, I ask for Jay Sarno. He says, yes. I said, this is Gil Rogan, Sports Illustrated. What do you want? Had you ever heard of Evel Neville? He said, who? I said, Evel Neville. He said, hell no, I never heard of him. I said, he's this kid's gonna jump the Grand Canyon. Says he's gonna jump the Grand Canyon. I said, he says he's gonna jump your hotel. He said, ah, he's nuts. I never heard of him. Call me back. So then I call him back the next day. I told him I was with Frank Quinn from Newsweek. I said, you ever heard of Evel Neville? He said, who? I said, Evel Neville. He said, hell no, I never heard of him. What's he do? I said, he's gonna, says he's gonna jump your hotel. He's gonna jump the Grand Canyon. Oh yeah, I heard about him. He said, I don't know what he's gonna do around here. I think he might do something. <laughs> he said, call me back. So I wait two days and call him back. I said, this is John Herring, Time Magazine. I said, you ever heard of this Evel Knievel? He says, Evel Knievel, Evel Neville, Evel Neville. I heard, <laughs> I heard of this guy. He said, he's gonna do something around here. Call me back. So I waited till the next Monday and I called him. She didn't even let me talk to him. She said, Mr. Sarno will see you at one o'clock. I go up to his office. He comes running out of his office with his arms out. He says, kid, where you been? I've been looking for you, he says. <laughs> the morning of the jump, I walked through the casino and I had one chip with me, $100. And as I walked through the casino to go outside, I bet 100 on 21. Dealer hit 21, I lost. I thought, oh boy, what a bad omen. I hit that takeoff ramp, and boy, I did not want to be short. Short, into the landing ramp. Throw me off down there at the bottom. You can see in that spill I took how my head just 
bangs into the asphalt and I slide across. And at the very end of it, you just split my leathers completely up the middle in my groin area. Just open them wide open. This is the Bell Magnum that I had on at Caesar's Palace. I wore this helmet one time. Had the most beautiful new paint job on it the, the day I jumped there. Look at it. it. This helmet absolutely saved my life. Even though I had this on, I was unconscious for 29 days. John Derrick shot that jump. Linda Evans, they were going together. He shot the jump, she shot the landing. She was sitting on the dunes, fence that separated the dunes from Caesar's Palace. Linda was in that hospital every, every day with me. I remember waking up and seeing a little can taped with some tape to this monkey bar I had so I could raise myself up in this hospital. And this note <clears throat> was from John Derrick. He said, I promised you this film. I'll never film you again unless you're wearing a parachute. Your pal, John. Now, he promised me before he filmed that, that he would never give it to anybody that belonged to me. And we got a projector in there and saw it. The first time I saw it, I about threw up. I couldn't believe how horrible it was. I would say that that jump and that landing probably was the biggest thing that ever happened to me as a performer to, for notoriety in my whole life. I guess I'm naturally a performer. I like what it does to me. I don't like to sit and watch somebody else in the arena. When you run short of guts, you ask yourself, when you're standing up there and sitting up there for that final thing, did they come to see me get killed? When I jumped, I spoke to people about how I felt. And I don't sound like a politician. I don't scream it through a microphone. I try to tell them how I feel about a jump and about what I'm going through. They think they really knew that I was risking my life. Vietnam, Watergate, drugs, and the Hell's Angels. America is disillusioned by the direction it's heading. The country is seeking an antidote, and it roars into their lives in a star-spangled package known as Evil Knievel. Little does he know it, but what he represents will cement his image as one of the most iconic figures of the 20th century. The last gladiator in the new Rome. I am a professional life risker, and I am the best in the world at it. There have never been none before me, nor there will never be none after me. I know this, I came along in the right time at the right place. The country was down. The country was down. Vietnam was in full progress. And I kind of thought Vietnam was a mistake, but I didn't say anything about it because I had so much respect from kids in Vietnam. And those who were in Vietnam that could watch me on TV and read about me in the Stars and Stripes and different magazines were over there, they associated with me because I didn't quit. I got shot down, I kept getting back up. I always lived by a saying that you can fall many times in life, but you're never a failure as long as you try to get up. I always lived by that. I thought that. I gave people something to, to think about, a spark of something to hang on to. I go to Indianapolis every year some of them cheat a little bit to get ahead, and they use a nitro. And their car runs for about five laps, and then it blows all to hell. And that's what will happen to you in life. If you take narcotics, you'll run for five laps, and you will blow all to hell. So the decision is yours. You make it. Several kids have come to me and said, you changed my life. I was in a lot of trouble. But listening to what I had to say, about believing in God and their loving their mother and their father and staying off the drugs and putting things into their body that would hurt them. But I had a horrible altercation with the Hells Angels. They had a group that were drug peddlers in this country, big ones. 
and for eight long years, I've spoken against alcohol and narcotics. I have fought viciously against the outlaws in this industry. And I took off a black leather jacket, put on a white one. So here I was in front of this huge crowd, a sellout crowd in the cow palace. Boy, these guys that were in the crowd, these hell's angels, they took great, a strong opinion against that. One of them threw a tire iron at me in the hallway while I was making my practice runs. I came back in and here was this guy, the same guy standing in the middle of the cow palace in front of 20,000 people or 15,000 was filled up, giving me the finger. You know, I always wanted to punch one of them bastards. And I rode this motorcycle at this guy and threw it down on that slick surface inside of that cow palace. And I slid it right in through, into him and knocked him over tea kettle in the air. And then the fight started. Five or six of them come and jumped on me. And half of that grandstand in that cow palace come out and stood behind me and just beat hell out of those hell's angels. They got just what they deserved. But the people, 99% of them were behind me and believed what I said was right. They liked what I did. The people liked what I, what I stood up against. And I'll tell you something. I hate to be referred to as a hero. I hate that. I'm not a hero. I'm a daredevil. I'm a daredevil. And you might say I'm a legend because of the time I performed and still alive for now. If you look the word up in the dictionary, that describes me pretty well. Well, you know, I was the pioneer. Nobody ever jumped like I did. Guy jumped one through a fire hoop, maybe 20 feet. And these car drivers, they'd strap themselves in a car and jump one car. Nobody ever jumped a motorcycle where they were just hanging on. Uh, let me ask you a couple names or say a couple names so you see what your reaction is other people who do something very much like you do super joe i'm here oh, the other motorcycle jumping? yeah well there are several of them around the country uh einhorn and uh, uh gary davis and rex blackwell and uh, bobby Bob gill. gill and there's uh, a couple of girls uh arena cave and uh, little debbie lawler who is yeah. now jumping they jumped almost as far as i did or maybe as far debbie Jumps, small jumps. She did very well for a girl. The jump in the Astrodome that uh, somebody said, I know you people hadn't said it, but somebody said it might have been a world record. Uh, well, I measured her jump, it was 103 feet. Well, I could spit further than that. <laughs> I didn't want any competition. I was a fierce competitor myself. And if somebody else would have jumped as far as I did the next day, I'd have jumped further the next weekend. I should have realized that that they were trying to be like me. It's the greatest compliment they could have paid me. I always thought to myself, I would sure like to be an Elvis Presley and a Liberace put together and entertain on a motorcycle. Liberace was, I think, absolutely the greatest performer I'd ever seen in my life. Oh, he just captured you. And when they introduced him, here he come from the top of the ceiling, flying around on a, a cable hooked to him, all the way around the whole area. <laughs> oh, boy. And, and then he'd land on his seat, and he had on these beautiful big mink and chinchilla coats. And You've got a beautiful audience. Bless you. Liberace, what a great performer. I remember the first time I went in a bar in Orange County. I was in there and had a jacket on and said, Evil Knievel, and there was a guy standing there at the bar. And he said, Evil Knievel, who's that? And I said, that's me. He said, well, what kind of a name is that? I said, that's my name. He said, Evil Knievel. He said, that's a good name. And I said, well, I haven't got used to it yet. He said, well, someday it'll be a, <clears throat> you'll be proud of it. We're back in the Los Angeles Coliseum, where some 25,000 people are waiting for Evil Knievel to make another one of his spectacular motorcycle jumps. This time, over 50 cars stacked up at the center of the field. Boy, the jumps look longer, and the ramps look higher, and the speed looks faster. Well, that's the way it gets. You've made a 
made a bed for yourself, you got to lie in it. I'm not looking forward to this 50 car jump, really, but until I choose to take this red, white, and blue number one off my shoulder, I'm going to try and jump as far as I can and keep going. Evil Knievel is going to make it. Evil Knievel is going to make it. Evil Knievel is not going to make it. Yeah. How come? It's too, it's too high and too far. We are now at the 51st row of the Los Angeles Coliseum. This is where the ski slide-like takeoff ramp has been mounted. A 200-foot in run, and this is a practice run of Evil Knievel, trying to see just exactly where he wants to be and at what speed. And you can really feel the tension mount here. Evil not even wanting to look down that ramp. I don't go down that runway praying. You go down that runway praying, you're liable to get killed, boy. You better brace yourself for what's on the other side. Motor J.C. Agajanian has given the all-clear signal. Now the crowd rising. Ready. This is going to be it. day another dollar I'll tell you this is if you were graded on form and beauty it would have been a hundred today it was absolutely a beautiful job if you don't really believe in what you're doing you cannot transfer that message to people they, they won't believe you there never has been anything quite like this man evil can even super daredevil my name is a household name, and I know it. But boy, I earned it. Did I pay a price? Jesus Christ, I paid a price. Being number one has its upside. But there is an even greater downside. To remain king, Evil Knievel is pushed to break record after record. And not just the records of his competitors. Beautiful jump, he did it! But his own as well. Whether it's the length of the jump or number of bones broken, Eagle strives to set the bar to unbreakable heights. 1974 will prove to be the pinnacle of his career. It will also be a year where Evil is forced to make a decision about a lifelong dream, a dream that could potentially end his life, the canyon jump. My name is Evil Knievel. I wear a red, white, and blue number one on my shoulder because I think I'm the best. In my business, you have to think you're the best. You end up dead. The man behind me is named Evil Knievel. He's a motorcycle daredevil, openly defies death on occasion after occasion. On July 4th, he hopes to become the only man ever to leap across the Snake River Canyon in Idaho. As a prelude to that, tomorrow in Dallas, Texas, he will take a warm-up leap. Once again, his life will be at stake. And I'm here with you live at the Green Valley Racetrack in North Richland Hills, Texas, where today, the extraordinary Evil Knievel will essay his longest leap yet over those 11 Mack trucks right behind me and with an adverse wind against him. You know, I'd go to a track sometimes, and I'd look at the jump I was about to make, and I'd look at like 13 or 14 or 15 trucks, and I'd say to myself, you know, I don't think that looks too far. You've jumped over 300 times. The champs had 11 misses. You feel that basically the crowd comes out to help you uh, make this jump. There's a few that don't. Does this bother you that people come out maybe to see you jump 10 instead of 11? How do you feel about that? I didn't come here to... Texas to jump any less than 11, I'm gonna jump those trucks. That's the way it should be. 
You know, there are some great athletes in this country who I respect greatly, but there wasn't one billionth of 1% of them that could do what I could do. That's, uh, this should Keep be our fingers crossed or uh, whatever it is you do, but let's do whatever we can to help him get over this thing. I sure hate for it to be 10. Hammer is a focused upon evil. Here he comes. He did it! Oh, wow. He did it! Yeah. Only 11 misses and 300 oh. leaps previously, and he did it! They didn't have any suspension in those days, front or rear even to speak of. The travel was only three inches at the most, maybe. You take these kids right now that are jumping, they really don't even need a landing ramp to land on. I needed the landing ramp because, so when I landed on it, it took the jolt and the danger out of hitting flat because if you hit flat, you'd break your back. I broke my back seven times. Now that's a heavy motorcycle to be hurtling through the air over obstacles and buses and buildings and fountains and things. Motorcycles they're making nowadays are so much easier to ride. That motorcycle's a big motorcycle. When you make the motorcycle jump, the best position for you to be in is on the balls of your feet, balanced perfectly from your weight up with it, your hands on the handlebars. You're going so fast, and the obstacle you're jumping goes underneath you so fast that all you're looking for is to hit that X on that landing ramp. You gotta make sure you're straight on the takeoff ramp when you hit it. Because if you're off, say, six inches at takeoff at the wrong angle, you get out 150 or 200 feet, you could miss the whole landing ramp. When you go to make a jump, the most important thing is that you're on the power curve. You have to be just far away from the jump to where you can shift the motorcycle enough times. So as you hit the takeoff ramp, it drives the motorcycle up the takeoff ramp, across the jump, with the front end up in the air. As you go across the jump, you twist the throttle a little bit to spin the back wheel. So it acts as a gyroscope to keep the front end going the opposite direction. Rear wheel going this way, front wheel going this way. That allows you to, to go through the air and the motorcycle perfectly on the back wheel at an attitude kind of like this where it's just exactly like it should be. I'll tell you what would definitely be a world record would be if you cl uh, cleared the Snake River Canyon up there. Are you going to do that? A and if so, when? Uh, I've always made this statement and I've tried to be honest that uh, I'm gonna milk that Snake River Canyon jump for all I can get out of it and I'm gonna do it when I'm damn good and ready. But this'll be the year. There's been a lot of controversy about motorcycle jumping, what the record is and what it isn't. Well, indoors today on Wide World of Sports, you're going to see me attempt to jump 17 vans and trucks. And today I'm going to make the announcement. I'm going to announce the Canyon Date Jump. Here in Portland, Oregon, King of the Daredevils, number one, Ebo Paniva. Thank you, Keith, and Evil Knievel has emerged from his van here at the Memorial Coliseum in Portland, Oregon. Colorfully garbed, as he always is, Evil Knievel has become a top hero, if you will, around the country. I would like to go back a few years with you when I did announce that I was going to jump the Grand Canyon. The Secretary of Interior, Mr. Stuart Udall, gave me permission in writing to jump across the Grand Canyon. They changed their minds that I couldn't jump that canyon. So I went to Idaho and I bought a piece of the Snake River Canyon. It's my canyon. Well, on Sunday, September the 8th, 
I'm gonna go like hell and I'm gonna get across that thing faster and further than you've ever seen me do. No question about it, evil can evil. He's quite a man. warming up and we're going to listen in on perhaps what's going on maybe you can hear it i remember saying to frank i don't know if he remembers this or not i said frank they came here today to see me spill my blood i can't even explain to you the feeling in your stomach when you ride up there on that takeoff ramp and look across that thing You cannot describe the feeling that you have to have inside of you to make you back off of that takeoff ramp after you've looked at it and turn around and go back and then take a run at it and try and jump across it. It is the most challenging, crazy, suicidal feeling in the world to do that. Here he comes. that I could make this jump in here. You know, we sold this place out tonight, and I just as soon missed the jump as have them boo me out of here, and uh, I'm almost to the end of my road, and I'm not gonna let that happen yet. I'll tell you, I, I have never made a better jump than that in my life, I don't think. You got the Snake River coming up. You said it'd be September the 8th. Uh, any jumping before that? Yes, I'm gonna make a big jump, a world record jump at the Canadian International Exposition of Toronto, Canada, and then we're going to the canyon Sunday, September 8th, and I'll see you there. Hey, go, let's lonely up there, isn't it? Well, you're all alone, but you got somebody with you, Frank. I've had somebody watching over me for a long time. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Evil Knievel, unusual to say the least. I don't know what the hell I was thinking of. I thought I was indestructible. I wasn't. I've never made a dime in the stock market. I didn't invest in something and get it. And I earned mine. I spilled my blood and broke my bones and every damn racetrack in America. I earned it. For Evil Knievel, the years of working in obscurity at the edge of financial ruin is over when Wide World of Sports broadcasts one of his jumps. This exposure catapults Evil into fame and fortune that is barely comprehensible for a small town boy from Butte, Montana. The physical abuse he's endured finally pays off, and it pays off big. But there's one thing that money can't buy his life to be a success in life you go through life like a whirlwind you don't really pay attention to things like family because they're just there you make sure they're there you make sure they're accounted for you make sure you're taking care of them but you would never get to be the success that I was if that is what you paid attention to can't happen because if you do that, you're taking away from the drive that is making you a success. And I had that drive. And he's set to go. Take off, of course, very critical. When I started with Wide World, I did it for nothing. The television rights came, and the movie, books. Wide World of Sports paid me as much as a quarter of a million for different jumps. I signed for four pictures with Irwin Allen and Warner Brothers. I'd made a deal with Harley Davidson. I had a red, white, and blue moneymaker that went 100 miles an hour that I rode. It was a money-making machine. A motorcycle toy was introduced, and there, were, there had never been a motorcycle toy. It was just unbelievable. The whole Knievel thing begins to make sense on a visit to the ideal toy company where Mr. Knievel is no cultural question mark, but the solid inspiration for $6 million worth of sales in one year, and that's real enough. Kids loved that toy, and their dads loved it. For the first time, here was a toy that really appealed to everybody. 
all of the little toys that came off of it. Puzzles, and drinking cups, and just everything you could think of came off of the success of that toy. Boy, the money I made off of that thing. Man, oh man, oh man. Just unbelievable. Toy grossed $350 million. That guy saved the toy industry. It was on its ass then. I didn't get it all. I mean, I made 5 to 10% of it, but it allowed me to live like a king. Paid for my yachts and my ship and my racehorses and my Stutzes and my Ferraris and my girlfriends and my beer and whiskey and everything that I had. Nothing in this world, I don't care whether it's furs, diamonds, automobiles, houses, anything you can name that is the best that I'm not going to have two of. Hi, good looking. I don't know what drove me to this, why I succumbed to it. I was so jealous of Linda, if another guy looked at her, I wanted to kill him. I mean, God, I loved her. But I'd go to a show where I was jumping, and during that time, I'd walk around to these booths when I was not performing, and I'd meet these girls, Miss New Jersey, Miss Showmanship, Miss Bike Week. I'd go back to my hotel, when I had a guy in a chair sitting outside of my room. Knock, 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 and here was a girl and a guy. This happened in two or three different cities, and she was Miss Cycle Show. And I said, well, who's this guy with you? Well, that's my boyfriend or my fiance or my husband. What's he going to do? He's going to wait. I'd say, what? He's going to wait out in the hallway. And one girl told me, I told him if he didn't let me be with you, I was going to leave him. And uh, I don't know what it was. I asked this psychiatrist one time, I said, what in the hell is going on with these women? He said, number one, you're not a bad looking guy. You're not the best looking guy in the world, but you're not a bad looking guy. I said, secondly, you're evil, but it's spelled E-V-E-L, but it represents doing maybe something wrong. It's attractive to a woman, but that she can live with. He said, thirdly, you're a life risker, and they see you jump. For some reason, that's danger is a real turn on to a woman. He represents adventure, danger, the excitement and like fascination that uh, most people only fantasize about. It became the strangest thing that any man could ever wish for. I used to bring a girl to bed in the afternoon, knowing that I was going to go out that night, just to wear myself down. You can take two a week times how many years, figure it out yourself. It's just mind-boggling. In Puerto Rico, eight in a day it was just like a candy bar, something I had to have. And I was married to the most beautiful woman in the world. Now, you doctors that are watching me, you psychiatrists, suck on that. He'll probably be doing about 75 or 80, I imagine. I was paid a lot of money by the Canadian International Exposition to come to Toronto, and I wanted to do it because it was going to help with the big expense I'd gone to at the canyon. This is the moment of psych. This is the moment where he sells himself on the idea that he can do it. He's done it so many times before, but every circumstance is different. Every obstacle is different. Visually, it is different. It is a long way across. And I don't know what I made at that Toronto thing, maybe twenty-five or $30,000, but then it was a lot of money. Boy, I'd come down to my last couple thousand bucks. Anyway, I jumped that close to the jump because I needed the money. Nobody that I had for a sponsor paid that million dollars to pay for that ramp and that fence and the rights and the attorneys and the everything to, to pay for that canyon jump that rocket i mean i had three of them built and now you hang on to your seats and i'll hang on to the handlebars and we'll get this harley davidson over these mac trucks and get this thing done thank you very much and everybody was real nervous because we knew if i didn't make that jump that i wouldn't be able to make the canyon jump 
I think maybe the thing that helps me most of all is uh, before I get ready to go, uh, the little prayer that I say that uh, kind of helps me get across and maybe the prayers that I can feel coming across the field from the grandstand. Absolutely perfect. He hit it right on target. And listen to the crowd. September the 8th, after the canyon jump is over, I hope that I'll see you there and uh, we'll have a cool one together. I went to Idaho and I bought a canyon. It's my canyon. And on September the 8th, I'll jump it. And the only way they'll get me out of the air is to shoot me out with an anti-aircraft gun because I am going to go, believe me. Evil Knievel seemed to be a man without fear. 300 jumps, over 50 broken bones. And that's why he's the king of the daredevils. Even if he was unsuccessful, he was always up for another jump. The thing is, it had to be bigger and better than his last. One stunt that would cost him more than any broken bone, Lake River Canyon jump. This dream jump could well be his last. You know, I've always talked about the canyon. Tremendous undertaking on my part. I had this goofy engineer named Doug Malwicky. He thought he was going to build a rocket for me where I could get a run at the canyon, then it'd take off and get across it. It would drop like a rock. And then Bob Truex came along and showed me another idea. This rocket is the one that I did try to go across the canyon in. It provided 15,000 pounds of jet horsepower, probably 10,000 pounds of thrust, and it would have put me about a half a mile across that canyon maybe between a quarter and a half. It was just so powerful. You'll see it on Wide World today, the canyon plate of Evil Knievel. When I went there that day to get in it, somebody painted a bullseye on the other side of the canyon wall. Right in it. Oh, it was a bad omen to me. And you've obviously thought about a lot about life and Death, are you afraid at this moment? I've never been afraid in my life of dying under any circumstances. I think that a man was put here on Earth to live, not just to exist. And today is the proudest day of my life. I'm living a dream that they thought could never be done, but it'll be done. And I got in that thing. The son of a. There are a lot of people who think your earlier two test failures of the X1 and X2 were put up phony jobs. Were they real failures? They were real failures. Mother Nature is rough enough to deal with without trying to uh, invent failures. I'd like to ask everybody in the booth right now to be silent. I mean, I know what men like Gary Gilmore felt when they stood in front of an executioner. I was a dead man. I never thought that I had a prayer. I didn't think that thing would get 10 feet. And I hope that no one ever sees in their wife's eyes and in their children's eyes what I saw in my wife's eyes and my kids' eyes the night before that jump. My wife was petrified. Uh, Jim, all I can tell you is, uh... Happy landings, Evil Knievel. Truax and all the other engineers were sitting in a van, the control center, 100 yards away from me, in front of me. It was in there for quite a while, and the rocket was heating, heating. The parachute, which was to be operated by my hand, was pulled back. I had to push it forward to let it go. It was pulled back and taped back with duct tape. We're one minute and counting. One minute to go, one minute. I had a choice, strap into it or tie me into it. So they tied me into it with a real firm, firm safety belt system. 
They got down to like 15 seconds. And I was counting down with them, sitting at that thing almost at this angle. And when it got to got to three, I said, God, take care of me. Here I come. Two, one. Boom. Whoa, it looks like a good one. Whoa. Oh, evil, stay with the bird. I remember the jolt put me back. It looks like he's... Whoa, there's been a mistake. He looks like he's going into the canyon. The ship's going down. It's, it's going down. And that parachute, the power was so much, that parachute blasted right out of that rocket, right on the launch pad. And I'll tell you what, when the parachute opened finally, I had a blackout when we took when I took off. Then I had a red out when it opened. That's where all the blood comes back into your system, into your eyes and out your nose and your mouth and your ears. I can never tell you what I said. I was so mad at that engineer. I screamed so loud from up there a thousand feet or so, way up in the air. I don't know why he never heard me on the ground. What does it look like, Bob? It looks like he didn't hold on to the handle. Like we feared. Yeah. That guy was an idiot. I never touched that chute. It was his fault, and his fault only, that I didn't make it across that canyon. Stupidity. And he's, he's going to crash. Now he's coming down about 17 feet per second. Slowly going down. Boy, it looks like he's down in the water. Robert Craig Knievel did not clear the 1,500-foot Snake River Canyon. All those people along the canyon, I could see them all. Most of them were silent, some of them were booing. And there I was floating down. And uh, it was a sad, defeating experience, believe me. I never want to relive it. Evil Knievel now appears to be standing in the boat and waving. He's alive and well. I waited seven years to get across that canyon. And that's what happened, because I put faith in that guy. But it, you didn't do a damn thing on the, the can is still on the, uh, on the thing. It is. Blew off it was right here on the lawn. Blew off by accident. Yeah, yeah. it was our fault. Yeah. That's no, what it's not your fault. It's yes, it is. Yeah. We should have run one more test. All right. And there, you heard it from Bob Truax, Evil did not deploy the parachute himself. It came off on the pad, a mechanical failure. Are you going to try it again? Well, I don't know what I'm going to do. I, uh, I sat in it and gave it my best. And I don't know what to tell you. Believe me. The way I think about it, here it's been 30 years. That canyon's still there. God hasn't moved it an inch. I don't see any big, long, long line of daredevils standing up there beating themselves on the chest saying, I'm going to try that. Do you? It's a turned on crowd at Wembley Stadium as Evil Knievel returns to action. I saw so many people I couldn't believe it. There were three times as many people in the stadium there to see me as there was in my whole hometown. So you haven't, uh, you haven't jumped in over a year? I sometimes think that maybe I should quit, but you always want to keep going. And I'm kind of proud of that red, white, and blue number one I wear on my shoulder. And I want to keep it on there. I'm glad you're here today. You know, I've never had an accident when you're around. It was Wembley Stadium. I got half the gate. They had 80-some thousand paid. I made a million dollars for that jump. Of course, there's one, one real significant problem about my jumps. You gotta be alive when it's over to collect the money. It's not whether you win or lose where I come from. It's how much heart you put into it. And the most important thing that you keep your word and get in and try. You hang on to your seats. I'll hang on to the handlebars. And we'll get this over with. As I was looking out of that tunnel into that stadium before I rode out, I thought to myself, you finally reached your goal. You have found the thing that makes you happy. You found the challenge. Now you go out there and do it. Just before he came out, he leaned out the window and looked at a crowd of 80,000 people. He said, what does a man have to do? 
get this many people together. And I looked at him and I said, Evil, you're doing it. Here I was clear across the Atlantic in another country. And I finally realized what drove me. Keep going. I finally woke up. I didn't have any death wish. It was just the excitement of the thing. And that's the day I realized it was at Wembley. 1966. Heard himself in Indio. 1967, Caesar's Palace. Here he goes, and he will go. Evil Knievel has made some 300 jumps and broken about 50 bones in his career as a daredevil, says he's calling it quits. made that announcement in London today after an attempt to make a hundred mile an hour jump over 13 buses ended in a spectacular crash. Despite a crushed vertebra and fractured hand, Knievel got up from a stretcher and returned to the ramp to tell 70,000 spectators. Ladies and gentlemen of this wonderful country, I've got to tell you that you are the last people in the world who will ever see me jump because I will never, ever, ever jump again. I'm through. And that's the way it is. Monday, May 26, 1975. This is Walter Cronkite, CBS News. Good night. Wide World of Sports was considered the number one sports show in all of the history of television. Of all of the Wide World of Sports top rated shows, I hold four of the top ten, I hold the number one spot. I created my own show, I created my own sport. I'm so proud of it. Robert Craig Knievel unwittingly launches the X Games genre when he becomes Evil Knievel, the king of the daredevils. But the smooth leather exterior that has come to personify his superhuman image now conceals a career total of 50 broken bones. Evil Knievel, the man of steel, is literally beginning to feel the steel plates holding him together. Evil, the obvious question is, uh, what are your future plans? Are you going to jump again? Yeah, I jumped the 25th of October. Mm -hmm. I'll jump Kings Island, Cincinnati. Now, uh, when you made the London jump, you said you were going to retire, then you changed your mind. Are you going to go back and make that jump again? Not in London. I jumped 13 buses in London. I'm going to jump 14 at Kings Island. 13 is an unlucky number. I just put myself in a trap all the time. I was behind the eight ball all the time. I kept jumping further and further and further after missing. Look at me in London. I went there and jumped 13 buses. Said I was all done. Ended up at Kings Island jumping 14. Just go further and further and further. Hello, I'm Frank Gifford. Back with Evil Knievel as we were in London last May to the 26th. Evil Knievel, of course, missed on that jump. He said right after that, I will retire. But indeed, Evil Knievel is back and he's going to jump. You have to ask yourself and wonder why is Evil Knievel back jumping? But something just struck me in the chest again to stand up and be a man. And I didn't exactly do that for the money. I did it because I wanted to go out a winner. I didn't want to go out a loser. And here he comes right now, Robert Craig Knievel. Evil, welcome to Kings Island. Thank you. Good crowd. Ready to go. Looks like there's enough of them to blow me over it if I can't get that Harley Davidson over it. The wind, we'll talk about that again, Evil, uh, adjusting a problem. 
Well, it looks from the side of the flags that it may have died down a little bit, but uh, I'm gonna go, Frank. There's no wind gonna stop me, not even a hurricane. And there is the jump, and I'll tell you, when you look at it in that perspective, you, it really is kind of awesome. 14 Greyhound buses. He does not have a speedometer on his motor. He goes strictly by field. And he's not hesitating. He'll go. Even though I mean, it looks like I made the jump perfectly, that motorcycle broke right in half. I didn't know it at the time because I was going so fast when I hit the brake. I thought it stopped like it should, but boy, when I got down there and took a look at it and turned it around, I could barely get it back to where the television cameras were. Busted the motorcycle right in half, Frank. Boy, it did come apart, didn't it? One night hit hard. I know. Just a little short. Thank you. You know, I I landed on number 14. I I didn't get all the way across it. This motorcycle is the finest machine in the world as far as I'm concerned. It broke in half, but it held me up. And all I can say is thanks to number one, thanks to Harley Davidson. You've been so good to me through the years. On the way to Austin, I stopped in Deming, New Mexico. We found a good Mexican restaurant with a bar, and this one guy says, see, I see him jump the Grand Canyon. And this other guy says, I seen him jump 100 cars in the LA Coliseum. I didn't jump the Grand Canyon, I jumped the Snake River. I didn't jump no 100 cars in the LA Coliseum, I jumped 52. And I got to thinking, if I have to live up to what these people think I am, a comic book character, Spider-Man or Captain Marvel or Superman, I won't be alive another year because they have stretched the truth about me so much that no man could ever stay alive trying to fill this bill. No man. Not even Evil Knievel. That's what made my decision to quit. I could not believe what they expected of me. They thought we could go into the Seattle Kingdom and do that jump, draw a big crowd. And it, it was big, but not nowhere near did it fill the Seattle Kingdom up. And of course, seven buses doesn't sound like a long jump for Evil Knievel, if you're familiar with his history. But keep in mind, there's a short in run here, and it could be very dangerous. And Evil Knievel, quite frankly, is very concerned about it. When you hit the pavement at 100 miles an hour, it really smarts. And it gets tougher as you get older in life to get up and keep going. Your mental attitude deteriorates with pain and long healing process. I've been hurt so many times. I've spent three years in hospitals or flat on my back. I'd like to kind of do this thing successfully and safely and just go ahead and hang it up. Abel says thumbs up. Crowd cheering in anticipation. They've said so many times before, there's nobody that turns on a crowd quite like Evil Knievel. I believe it's going to go. He hits the ball, he's going. You saw what happened here tonight. You saw the motorcycle nosedive. I really didn't do it right. The power curve was wrong, and even me, after jumping for 12 years, I even make mistakes still now. You've been a wonderful crowd. Thank you. Never thought I'd run out of talent. Never thought I'd run out of nerve. Never thought I'd run out of whiskey or beer or anything. Boy, I did. I ran out of them all. This guy named Bob Arum, he was the president of Top Rank. He's the fight 
promoter. Anyway, Top Rank was a promotional company that showed the canyon jump. Sold out every venue they ever had all over the world for that canyon jump. Sold them out. Guy didn't pay me beans. He pretended to be my friend. Fight promoters are flesh users. That's what he is. Arab hired some of the most sleazy bastards you could ever imagine in the world. Like Shelly Saltman. I wanted to buy a book that these rats wrote about Elvis Presley. Just came out. So I went down there to buy the book, and this guy handed me one about myself. He said, here's one you're going to like a lot less. He said, what do you read what this guy wrote about you? And it said, on tour with the X-rated Evil Knievel by Sheldon Saltman. I couldn't believe it. He called me a, a drug user for him to say that I hated my mother, for him to say that I should be a woman in Butte, Montana. I had to take my kids out of school, for Christ's sake. You know what I did to him? I caught him. I went to the guard gate at 20th Century Fox. I said, you know Shelly Salmon? Oh, yeah, he's the vice president. I said, where's he at? Well, you'll probably catch him up in the commissary. I caught him going right into it. And I took that baseball bat after that guy. I had a guy with me. It's because I was afraid he'd take the bat away from me and hit me. I couldn't hang on to it very good. Both of my arms were broken. Both of them. I had casts on them from an accident. I had to hold that ball bat with both hands. And they asked me when I went to trial if I had any remorse. I said, no, I have no remorse. My attorney told me to plead no low contendery. I fired him. I told him I'm not pleading anything. I did it. I stood up to it. I was proud that I finally took a stand against him. God created all men, and baseball bats and Winchester made them all equal, and that's just the way I was. Well, but I mean, you really can't believe what you're saying, that if somebody were to, were, were to write something about them, you have the right to go after them with a baseball bat? I think I Why did would, him a favor by going after him with a baseball bat. A judge in Santa Monica, California today sentenced stuntman Evil Knievel to six months in jail for assault with a deadly weapon. I was on a work furlough program. I got to get out during the day. So the word got around that I had a chauffeur driving my studs out to my office out in North Hollywood and then to the Universal Sheraton for lunch every day. I was on work furlough in the Beverly Hills Hotel in the Polo Lounge and drunk and out at the Sheraton drunk. So I told the guys that were on work furlough, I said, if I win this Rose Bowl game, I'm gonna get you all limousines. Well, I won it. So the day after the game, here comes all these limousines into the parking lot of that county jail. And here comes all these prisoners out of the jail. And these limos took the guys to where they were supposed to work. That was the deal. Oh, boy, the havoc it caused. It was fun while it lasted for those few inmates who got to ride in style today. The last time they were in the back of a car being driven anywhere, they were in handcuffs. I really thought at the time that it would bring some morale to some guys in the whole jail system that knew I was doing this to make them feel good about themselves. Most of all, to make their kids feel good about them. I don't think I'll get in any trouble over it. I hope I won't for trying to help somebody. That's all I can tell you. On the toy front, it may not be a Merry Christmas for Daredevil Evil Knievel. Knievel was in prison this week on assault charges, and Ideal Toys says it doesn't know yet if it will keep selling Evil Knievel stunt motorcycles and other toys. And that could be a big loss for Knievel. The guy I hit with a ball bat created so much stink in L.A. In my toy career, in my pinball career, in my clothing career, in my television career, and all products associated. I was in so much trouble, I couldn't believe it. Two days before they were going to parole me, I said, the hell with it, I'm not going back to jail. I'm going to go after this guy again, this Saltman. Oh, I never forgave this guy what he wrote about me. Never. Anyway, uh, I escaped. Came back about 2 o'clock in the morning when I wised up. They arrested me right away for escape. Evil Knievel is confined in a maximum security cell tonight. Judge Rafiti in Santa Monica will determine later this week on how much he's going to have to pay for being five hours late in returning back to jail. So when I was sent back down to get more sentence, he could have given me three years for the escape and the limousine thing, but he didn't. He sentenced me to six more months. And so a much subdued Evil Knievel returns to jail. The words of the judge Rafiti in his ears, that you are no longer the daring Evil Knievel, you are Robert Craig Knievel with a booking number. Sold almost everything I had. Never took care of my family like I should have. Robbie is 
off the wall. I don't know what happened. I was rebellious and crazy just because I had a crazy father in my mind. The more I found out about him, the more I wanted to be like him. In July of 1971, Evil Knievel's two sons, Kelly and Robbie, appear for the first time with their father at Madison Square Garden. It will be another three years before they make another public appearance, this time in Toronto, just days before the famous Snake River Canyon jump. Soon after, older son Kelly decides that the daredevil life is not for him. Now, I usually don't like to be in the spotlight. I think that was the main reason. Plus, I don't have as much guts as they do. <laughs> but from the start, younger brother Robbie is drawn to the wildlife of the motorcycle daredevil. Oh, he's just a hellraiser from day one. He's a great rider. I mean, the reason he's still going is because I started him when he was like four or five years old, teaching him how to ride a motorcycle, a little mini bike. I tied a rope around my waist and tied it to the back of the mini bike. So that's how he taught us. But my dad did not encourage me at all to jump. I mean, he would crash, get in the ambulance with me and my brother, and say, look at me, He'd be all busted up. And he's going to the hospital and say, look at me, never do this. I never want you to do this. But he knew that I was going to do it. He knew it. He was a superhero to me like he was any other kid. And he wore the red, white, and blue. And I remember standing in his truck and watching him take a shot of wild turkey in his dressing room before he did a jump. Robbie, what the hell is this? Look at this. You want to get hurt? My father, he was like a drill sergeant, sometimes. Why don't you change that? You're not supposed to have a, a brake lever like that. I want you to get that fixed before tonight. Do you understand? He was like a superhero, but real life hero. And that's why I wanted to follow in his footsteps and do what he did, like most kids want to do what their dads do. You know, I have a special night tonight because I have two sons. I always wanted them to perform with me and do some writing under my guidance at the last performance I would ever have before the canyon jump. And this is that performance. And I would like you to meet my sons, Kelly and Robbie. My brother didn't ride as much as I did. So his life was going another way. I didn't know it at the time. But he knew I was the eye of the tiger, the young kid, the crazy one, the middle black sheep, whatever you want to call me. But that's what I wanted to do. This is Robbie. Look at this little guy go. And the crowd was going nuts. And that's when I said, this is what I want to do for a living. And it stuck in my head. And I kept it there and wanted to do that ever since. I was 11 years old. I'd like to do some wheelies for you. Would you like to see some wheelies? OK. I'd like to have my youngest son, Robbie, come up. I'd like to have him do some wheelies with me. Robbie? That was the main day, I think, that I introduced Robbie to his career, where he did the wheelies and things. As you look at him, with your son, Robbie, 14 years old, as you heard. It was a pretty proud day in my life. If I had known what it was going to end up with like him, I probably wouldn't have been so proud. I don't know why he went the wrong way. I said, is it because I bought you too many motorcycles? He had a garage. He had 12 motorcycles in the garage. So it went from a trailer house to being poor to eight acres in this huge home two Learjets, five Ferraris, a Lamborghini, a Maserati, and a 118-foot fed ship and a home in Fort Lauderdale. I said, what in the world have I done wrong? I'm trying to give you everything you want. I just, I can't understand it. There was a rebellious part of me that was like my father. Robbie really tried me, tried my temper. Things didn't really get fiery between me and my dad until I was like 16 when I moved out. Robbie was only trying to do what I did, or what I said I did. The way I drank, and I ended up doing drugs in my era, my father pretty much showed me how to drink in the 70s. 
I don't blame him. Maybe I do. Maybe I don't. It was difficult being the son of Evil Knievel when I was growing up, um, you know, going through all his pressure. He had a lot of pressure on him. It was, you can understand, you know, if you were, uh, if you stopped and thought about what he was going through all the time. Thank you very much. Have a nice welcome. It's great to be back down to Los Angeles Coliseum again to see a lot of my old friends. I made this same jump at about the same distance in this Coliseum a few years ago. I never thought about death. I thought about confidence, positive mental attitude, the things my dad taught me. When I started jumping, I put that positive mental attitude, what he always taught me. Death was a part of it and still is. And I wasn't a born adrenaline junkie. This is a time for Robbie to make final mental adjustments, collect his thoughts, focus in on the challenge. The huge crowd. They expect around 50,000 here. They completely closed the Las Vegas Rip just for this event. I'll say this, Robbie's got a lot of guts. I'll tell you one thing, though. An incident happened at Caesar's Palace. When I jumped it, I built a ramp, a takeoff ramp, to run across and jump. So I said, Robbie, this was the day before. Robbie, I want you to build a safety ramp out from your landing ramp 12 feet wide and 25 or 30 feet long nobody will know the difference but it could save your life so he said dad i don't want to build a safety ramp i'm robbie knievel i said well look i'm evil knievel and i'm telling you you build that safety ramp oh he argued with me and argued with me then he got mad he said i ought to punch you in the mouth i said i said you're going to build a safety ramp. My dad said I never wanted to use a safety deck. At one time, I didn't, but ever since, that was years ago when I was a punk, and I always use a safety deck. It's very smart. It's not smart to jump, but it's smart to use a safety deck. Duh. I don't know what I'm talking about. I am not the greatest daredevil in the world. I am absolutely not. I am the father of the greatest daredevil in the world. And I would like to introduce you to my son, Robbie, the greatest daredevil. And obviously choked up, evil for evil, embracing Robbie. Tonight, Robbie's ultimate dream. And even though it's the same jump that nearly ended his father's life 21 years ago, a jump that sent his father into a coma, left a one-inch discrepancy in the lengths of his legs, he is determined to get revenge. So I watched him real carefully, and he got on his motorcycle, and he made his runs back and forth. He jumped, he landed 15 feet short of the landing ramp. He landed on the safety ramp at 75 or 80 miles an hour. If that safety ramp had not been built, Robbie would have decapitated himself at the neck, took his head off. What an incredible sight! Robbie Knievel's dream has come true! So now after the jump, he walks up to the microphone. He says, I love you, Dad. That was for you, Dad. I love Dad. But I know he loves me. Can't change that. No kick in the butt was ever hard enough to have him not love me. Too much traffic out here. We'll go for right. All right. I'll see you in a little while. Both sides some autographs. I'll see you later. I'll see you later. I'll see you later. I love you, buddy. I'll see you later. I love you, too. I think he should just quit before he gets killed. Most athletes quit when they're 40. I put 10 more years into my life. I'm going to jump forever if I can. He'll be the luckiest kid in the world if he doesn't end up in a wheelchair. And it'll be break my heart. I am a perfect example of someone who had a desire, a burning desire to do something, a dream. And I lived it. 
Being a true gladiator, many believe that evil would die in the arena. And when you live every day like it's gonna be your last, it's gotta be hard stepping out of the spotlight. Now, evil often spoke of jumping again, but years of hard living made for some pretty hard landing. In 1999, his past finally caught up to him. Hepatitis C, contracted from blood transfusions, was destroying evil's liver. Without a transplant, he was gonna die. As usual, he beat the odds. And the granddaddy of extreme sports was back. In 1992, Evil met and began a relationship with 22-year-old golf pro Crystal Kennedy. And Evil was 53 at the time. I'm lucky I have Crystal to stand by my side. In November of 1999, shortly after Evil recovers from his liver transplant, he and Crystal are married at Caesar's Palace. Less than a year later, they divorce, but to this day remain together as a couple. If it wasn't for Crystal, my being so happy with her, I really think that I would spend my life on the road. I'm a gypsy, and I admit it. I just am. But I love to travel in that coach. I just love it. It's as big as you can get, and it's got everything in the world in it. Tiffany lighting and king-size bed. It's got a bedroom prettier than any suite at Caesar's Palace. I hope, while you were all here, you got a chance to look at our new Wells Fargo display trailer that they just built me. Beautiful and 40-foot trailer where everything is stationary. The trailer has a lot of memorabilia in it. It's beautiful to see, and I take it to all my performances and all my shows. So I call it my Wells Cargo Evil Knievel experience. And I just pull it up and or into your showroom or in front of your place and just open it up. And you can see the things in it. And I sign autographs in the different stores or malls that I go to. Well, what do you think? How's it look? Like it, Earl? So I've got the Triumph in here that I jumped Caesars with. Then the Harley Davidson XR 750 that I made my last three jumps on. And the rocket is just like it was when it came out of the canyon. This Harley Davidson is, is uh, my own personal bike that I ride. George Latest from Latest Motors in Portland, Oregon gave me this bike. I almost want to get on that 750, but it'd make it, I don't really want to make another jump on it. I've had a lot of people say, why don't you just quit and not do it? I don't know, if I just quit, what am I going to do? I just lay in bed and watch TV, walk around the coach for exercise. I can't do that. Uh, what did it feel like jumping over Snake River, uh, Snake River Canyon? It's scary. I didn't tell anybody, though. I just told them I was concerned. I have a skeleton, a big skeleton that I have all the plates in and everything that my doctors made for me. I talk to it. I say, see, evil, I told you you shouldn't have made another jump. I pretend the skeleton is me. But anyway, it it uh, it works out all right. Can you imagine me at this age trying to jump? People wouldn't think that was dignified. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, let's give a great Canadian welcome to a man who is known throughout the world as the last of the gladiators, the all-time king of the daredevils, Evil Knievel. Did you ever hear about my great-great-grandfather? He was a gladiator in Rome. Caesar hated him. Dug a hole in the middle of the arena, buried him up to his neck. And Caesar got the meanest lion in all of Rome. Had him flowing from Africa over there. Put him in a cage, fed him for a month, starved him to death. Then he let him out at this big Julius Caesar gathering they have in this big arena in Rome. And this lion pounced. And as he went to grab my grandfather by the neck, my grandfather ducked. The lion went right over his head. My grandfather leaned up and bit the lion's balls off. And he spit him right at Julius Caesar. You know what Caesar said? Fight fair, Knievel, you son of a Fight fair. That was my great-great-grandfather. I'd love to be in the arena, too. <laughs> 
I owe God for watching over me every day. I know it. If a doctor were to come to me today and tell me I had two weeks to live, I would pray that I would go to heaven and I would be thankful. I thank God for every wonderful day I've had. I'm so thankful for that. Come on, baby, light my fire. Come on, baby, light my fire. I think to be known as a man who kept his word with people and stood against the odds is good enough for me. I don't care what else they say about me. I know my grandkids love me. I know my children do. I don't know what else a man could ask for. What the hell are you gonna, what are you gonna ask for when you die? I really am blessed realizing how short life is. Can you imagine? I wasn't a team. I wasn't two guys. I wasn't a fraternity of the sporting world. I was just one guy. Came along with a show in the right time, the right place, and I captured the hearts and imagination of Americans. What a wonderful feeling.